Hi everyone, Wally Nichols with the Asset Guidance Group weekly update for the week ending June the 11th, 2021. Let's talk this week about inflation because that's been the driver all of this week in the markets. Markets into the week at all time highs, uh, tailed back with a little bit of profit taking. S&P 500 growth backs in, is back with a vengeance. Uh, mid caps and small taps uh, took a bit of a breather. Small caps faring much better than mid caps. All this is because of the argument is inflation here to stay is it just temporary is it going to leave let's get into it all right so this is important because this is going to the answer to this questions is going to impact fed money policy which directly impacts all the markets okay equities fixed income however you want to look at it and so if inflation is being baked into the into the structure of the economy long term then that's definitely going to impact policy and we need to be ready for that. If this is only transitory or temporary, then we might need to adjust ourselves a little bit as we finish out the rest of uh, 21 and Q3 and Q4 and then going into 2022 looking for a fully reopened economy and normalized earnings again. What if it's a little bit of both? What if the, some of this is being structurally built in right now and some of it's temporary? Let's check it out. All right, so first let's talk about the evidence that this is temporary. Right now, what we're seeing here, this the top chart is the commodities uh, index, okay? Commodity prices have been rising over the last year and a half since the shutdown, all right, when they bottomed out. Uh, and the bottom half of that chart here is a ratio between inflationary prices and deflationary prices, two different indexes. We can learn a lot by using the ratio. And so what we see here is there's a 27% higher ratio on inflationary prices than on the deep as compared to the deflationary. Here's what's going on right now. Consumer prices 5% as compared to last year. Now that's a pretty big move. That's that's the largest move that people have seen in a while. People freaked out, but also the analysts at the Fed said, hang on a second. We're just looking at a one year change here. And that's what these numbers are. There was a 3.8% rise in the core inflation rate, which excludes food and energy prices, and energy prices was a big part of that 5%. Um, but still, that's the sharpest increase in, in, in 30 years, basically. Um, the used car prices is also a driver in this. There are hardly any new cars available, so used cars is what is available for, every, uh, for, for, for people that are in the market buying right now because of the chip shortage, okay? And um, and then and then in, uh, the employment figures weren't quite what they wanted them to be, but uh, uh, the sharpest spike. Let me back up to that point again. This is why this is this is uh, they were expecting four point seven. So you had more than what was expected, but the they, the Fed looked at this and said, "Look, that's only a one year thing, and we shut down the economy uh, that year. So this really." isn't even as high as it was back in 2009 with the Great Recession. And food, uh, for that one year that we were shut down, food is still relatively tame. So the prices of food have not gone out, out of whack. Gasoline, energy, that, that has spiked. But we know that there's been a couple of outlying factors with that. I mean, we had that option spike uh, uh, last year, and then we also had this horrific wintertime shutdown of taxes, okay, <laughs> one of the biggest producers, so you couldn't get stuff out of Houston. They had to shut down those plants, so that that was a disruption. You had the Colonial Pipeline disruption, so a lot of those things were temporary, and and we are are fixing those, okay. Um, the volatile food and energy that they that they measure was up three point eight percent versus three and a half percent expected. That's the fastest pace since 1992. That's that 30 year thing I was telling you about. But again, this is because the Fed is dismissing that because they're saying, look at this. Don't place so much emphasis on the fact that this is a 12 month change because we haven't seen a 12 month like this one in, in, in 100 years, you know. So um, we shut down the economy because of the COVID-19 pandemic. What we're, going, what we're going through right now is supply chain bottlenecks, and those are going to resolve. And so by the end of the year, we expect things to be normalized. Again, we will have gone through that last wave of COVID variants and everything. We've got more 
tools to deal with that now. Hospitals aren't in danger of, uh, we're not in danger of shutting down our healthcare system as we were before. So things are better. We're better prepared. We can, we can make our way through this. So despite this intensity and the spike in, 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 in CPI data, they believe that the uh, notion, and there's more evidence to support the notion this is temporary than it is long-term inflation. So speaking of long-term inflation, then let's shift the argument to that side of the equation and let's see what evidence there is to be concerned about structural issues. If these are going to be permanent changes, we need to make some changes. We don't want to be in certain markets. We want to be in other markets, okay? So what we've got here is a gross domestic product. Uh, so product, you know, gro our, our growth is 6% uh, year over year. CPI, which is outpacing inflation, is 5%. The problem that people are seeing, the CPI is a problem if it becomes long-term. Uh, if it does it again next year, 2022, at 5%, then we've got something that, you know, that's going to change things. We should know about that sooner rather than later. But productivity is up. So GDP, the economy is growing. Uh, and maybe people want it at a higher than 6%, but we are still reopening. But the long-term evidence is that consumers are 70% of the economy. If real wages aren't keeping up with, if they're only half of GDP, if they're only, you know, a little, basically half of CPI, if inflation is outpacing us two to one, then um, uh, at some point you're going to have a, a long-term problem and that would cause the Fed to adjust money policy. A lot of this is in, in going into the fact that this is probably going to be a more permanent structure. You've had employers in the food industry that are, uh, are raising the pay that they are offering their people to come back to work so uh, and the uh, increase in, in minimum wages. So if the cost, this is, this is not a political thing. This is just the fact that if the costs that these companies have going in into the finished product that you buy, you go to Chipotle, you go to any place, you go buy that burrito, that taco. If the, if the structure uh, and the inputs of uh, the cost of getting that product out the door to you so that you can consume it are going up, then those companies you know, are looking at an increase of 3 or 4% because of the uh, benefit packages and the higher wages they're having to pay. That's going to go into that product. So that is not going to be cured by a bottleneck in the supply chain straightening out necessarily. That's more likely to be a, a long-term uh, price. So the cost of that food product is up and that's going to be there for a while. So that's a structural type of inflation. And so at some point, if all of these factors continue, then the Fed has to say, whoops, that's the end of the accommodative money policy. We're going to tail that back. And when they start doing that, interest rates start rising, then the bond markets and the, and, and the equities uh, are, are going to change their pricing accordingly. We're going to have to be way ahead of that, okay, in order not to, to be in a calamity. So then you're going to see growth uh, sectors, uh, you know, losing uh, value and um, uh, the prices falling around the cycle. So. Other analysts have said, okay, if that happens, then we may be really looking at a commodity super cycle because we haven't been doing a lot of capital expenditure in, in the energy sector, a lot of the, or the mining, because a lot of these uh, industries have been shifting over to uh, uh, more environmental friendly type of activities because of concern about climate change and that type of thing. And so as you continue to have inflation on a long-term basis, the value of the dollar is, not, is going to decrease. And so more small cap companies with free cash flow are going to be located internationally than domestically. So then we need to start looking and be prepared to look at international sleeves such as Europe and, and around the world to bolster our opportunities in those markets. Not to get ahead of ourselves though, Let's not uh, just, just make a knee-jerk reaction here. As Warren Buffett said, the markets are wonderfully efficient mechanisms for transferring wealth from impatient people to patient people. So let's look a little closer at some of the good news that are out there, some of the redeeming factors, okay? Reasons not to overact 
overreact include the fact that crude oil is trending down long term. Okay, even with the spikes that we've seen, still the trend is down and it has been for 13 years uh, since the Great Recession, 2008, 2009. Uh, more and more core costs of living are actually trending flat, believe it or not, if not down, in a number of key areas. That's the, that's the very core of what it takes to, uh, to stay on. So those factors aren't ticking up right now. And the big deal with, uh, with building supplies and that type of thing, which are spiking right now, is that is the supply chain bottleneck and the fact. So it's not just logistics. It's also the fact that, if you remember, it was so long ago that we couldn't find paper products in the stores, okay? And that's because they just shut down the mills. They shut down production because they anticipated no demand uh, for building supplies, and that didn't happen. Actually, demand increased, and so we got the full panoply of uh, problems going on there. So production stopped, and then you also tack on top of that the logistics problems, and that's the big problem with that bottleneck so that is a temporary thing as 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 time goes on that will change and that will um, you know cease to be the problem so we expect building materials not to continue to be uh, so outrageously priced this is a chart showing what i was saying since 2008 the downturn it's been in a channel we've seen a lot of volatility it's a big spikes here but overall trend is down uh, for crude oil and that's for economies worldwide. And then you've got the labor productivity is at a 10-year high. So productivity hasn't been <clears throat> this high since 2009. And then you would have to go back again, really, uh, almost almost 20 years. So about 2003, uh, you know, back to 2001, um, before you would have those kind of high productivity factors again. And look, the velocity of money, we looked at this a couple of months back, you know, to see when inflation, inflation arguments first started uh, and, and see if there was any real fears uh, justifiable at that time. Not a lot has changed. It's upticked a little bit in terms of velocity, but the, the velocity hasn't been uh, really, I mean, it's not even close to being back where it was really back in, uh, in, in, in the recession. <clears throat> It really, in 20 years, it's not. It's it's lower than it was 20 years ago, December of, of 2001. So uh, there's no indication there uh, that that there's any a real concern about uh, true inflation getting out of control. Velocity has to be there. It's a missing factor. Now, once those the stimulus checks actually get dispersed, that is going to increase velocity. But as you can see, we've got a long ways to go before it even gets back into that into that historical normal range. So not a lot of concern there, as is reflected by the, the bond markets on the 10-year yields. Uh, they're, they're, they're not showing great concern over uh, any type of inflation, much less hyperinflation. So everything's looking good along those lines. All right, so maybe you feel a little bit better now. We trade the markets as they present themselves to us. We anticipate uh, change by getting prepared through analysis and being ready with, with different alternative plans should scenarios present themselves. And uh, if, you, if you need some help along these lines, by all means, reach out and touch base with me. Remember to like and subscribe and share with your friends and family so that we can share our passion for financial services with as many people as possible because everybody benefits. We're on your side and the rising tide lifts all ships, all right? It's been a great week. It's going to be a good one next week. Enjoy your summer. Everything's really getting back to normal. We'll see you next time.